Life Audio. Today's psalm is one of the longest psalms in the Bible. After Psalm 119, Psalm 78 is one of the longest psalms that you're going to read. And it's important because it's a history psalm. And it's not just a rehearsal of all of the events of history, but it's a reflection on history. And this is a psalm that's called a mascal, which if you remember from the past when we've taught about the mascals, it's a psalm that is a teaching psalm. So there's a lot to get into today. After a quick word from our sponsor, we'll dive right in. Stay tuned. Let's see, if something costs less, but people are happier with it, That sounds like something to look into, and that's MediShare. Maybe you've heard switching to MediShare to pay for health care can save the typical family 500 bucks a month, and that's huge. But it's also true that people are way more satisfied after making the switch, too. The customer satisfaction rate for MediShare is double that of the typical health insurance plan. Double. MediShare works. It's been around for more than a quarter century, and members have shared more than $3 billion of each other's bills. People love having telehealth and a huge nationwide PPO network. So, yeah, you can save a ton and like it better. Imagine being happy with how you're taking care of your health care. So if you're self-employed or part of the gig economy or you just want to plan you're happy with, you can call right now and get a price within two minutes. A very, very smart use of two minutes. Here's the number you need. 888-SHARE-19. That's 888-SHARE-19. 888-SHARE-19. Christians should be serious about our faith. But does that mean we need to be serious people all the time? Especially in a world of weird, absurd stuff? And even when Christian culture gets crazy? I'm Barnabas Piper of the Happy Rant Podcast, where we cheerfully rant about pop culture, church culture, work, creativity, life, and just about everything. But we take Jesus seriously. Listen and subscribe at lifeaudio.com. Hey friends, welcome to the Hearing Jesus Podcast. Do you sometimes doubt if you're truly hearing God's voice or if it's really your own? And how do you know the difference? Do you ever struggle to feel confident in your relationship with God and what He says in His Word? Do you sometimes feel stagnant or like maybe you hit a wall in your spiritual life? Hey, I'm your host, Rachel Grohl, missionary, author, pastor, and life coach, and I have been there. I too was doubting God's voice in my own life. I felt insecure about my relationship with him, and I wanted to be obedient to what God was calling me to do, but I wasn't quite sure how to figure out what that was. I felt like I was wasting time trying to figure it out, and I just wanted a way to understand his will for my life. The answer for me was found in the pages of the scriptures, as I learned how to understand what they were actually saying. If you're ready to grow in your faith and to step confidently into the calling God has for you, then join me as we dig deep into God's Word so that you can learn to live out your faith in your everyday life. Hey friends, welcome back to the Hearing Jesus Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Grohl. Today we are in Psalm 78 and we are continuing our reading through the Psalms as we learn more about this hymn book of Jesus and the disciples. If you would like the free devotional journaling prompts that come out every Monday. You can sign up at shehears.org to get on the newsletter list. And every Monday we send a, a journaling prompt to help you process this information and make it relevant to your own daily life. And then if you would like any of the previous episodes, Psalms 1 through 50 are available in a guided journal at shehears.org in the resources section. So I'm going to be starting at verse 1. It's long, so bear with me. Oh, my people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter hidden things from of old. What we have heard and known, what our fathers have told us, we will not hide them from their children. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel which he commanded our forefathers to teach their children so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. Then when they put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands, they would not be like their forefathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation whose hearts were not loyal to God, whose spirits were not faithful to him. The men of Ephraim, though armed with bows, turned back on the day of battle. They did not keep God's covenant and refused to live by his law. They forgot what he had done and the wonders he had shown them. He did miracles in the sight of their fathers, in the land of Egypt, in the region of Zoan. 
He divided the sea and led them through. He made the water stand firm like a wall. He guided them with the cloud by day and with the light from fire all night. He split the rocks in the desert and gave them water as abundant as the seas. He brought streams out of a rocky crag and made water flow down like rivers. But they continued to sin against him, rebelling in the desert against the Most High God. They willfully put God to the test by demanding the food they craved. They spoke against God, saying, Can God spread a table in the desert? When he struck the rock, water gushed out and streams flowed abundantly. But can he also give us food? Can he supply meat for his people? When the Lord heard them, he was very angry. His fire broke out against Jacob, and his wrath rose against Israel, for they did not believe in God or trust in his deliverance. Yet he gave a command to the skies above and opened the doors of the heavens. He rained down manna for the people to eat. He gave them the grain of heaven. Men ate the bread of angels. He sent them all the food they could eat. He let loose the east wind from the heavens and led forth the south wind by his power. He rained meat down on them like dust, flying birds like sand on the seashore. He made them come down inside their camp, all around their tents. They ate till they had more than enough, for he had given them what they craved. But before they turned from the food they craved, even while it was still in their mouths, God's anger rose against them. He put to death the sturdiest among them, cutting down the young men of Israel. In spite of all this, they kept on sinning. In spite of his wonders, they did not believe. So he ended their days in futility and their years in terror. Whenever God slew them, they would seek him. They eagerly turned to him again. They remembered that God was their rock, that God most high was their redeemer. But then they would flatter him with their mouths, lying to him with their tongues. Their hearts were not loyal to him. They were not faithful to his covenant. Yet he was merciful. He forgave their iniquities and did not destroy them. Time after time, he restrained his anger and did not stir up his full wrath. He remembered that they were but flesh, a passing breeze that does not return. How often they rebelled against him in the desert and grieved him in the wasteland. Again and again, they put God to the test. They vexed the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember his power. The day he redeemed them from the oppressor, the day he displayed his miraculous the signs in Egypt, his wonders in the region of Zoan. He turned their rivers to blood. They could not drink from their streams. He sent swarms of flies that devoured them and frogs that devastated them. He gave their crops to the grasshopper, their produce to the locusts. He destroyed their vines with hail and their sycamore figs with sleet. He gave over their cattle to the hail, their livestock to bolts of lightning. He unleashed against them his hot anger, his wrath, indignation, and hostility, a band of destroying angels. He prepared a path for his anger. He did not spare them from death, but gave them over to the plague. He struck down all the firstborn of Egypt, the first fruits of manhood in the tents of Ham. But he brought his people out like a flock. He led them like sheep through the desert. He guided them safely so they were unafraid. But the sea engulfed their enemies. Thus he brought them to the border of his holy land, to the hill country his right hand had taken. He drove out nations before them and allotted their lands to help them as an inheritance. He settled the tribes of Israel in their homes, but they put God to the test and rebelled against the Most High. They did not keep his statutes like the fathers. They were disloyal and faithless, as unreliable as a faulty bow. They angered him with their high places. They aroused his jealousy with their idols. When God heard them, he was very angry. He rejected Israel completely. He abandoned the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent he had set up among the men. He sent the ark of his might into captivity, his splendor into the hands of the enemy. He gave his people over to the sword. He was very angry with his inheritance. Fire consumed their young men and their maidens had no wedding songs. Their priests were put to the sword and their widows could not weep. Then the Lord awoke as from sleep, as a man awakens from the stupor of wine. He beat back his enemies. He put them to everlasting shame. Then he rejected the tents of Joseph. He did not choose the tribe of Ephraim, but he chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loved. He built his sanctuary like the heights, like the earth that he had established forever. He chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheep pens. From the tending the sheep, he brought him to be the shepherd of his people, Jacob, of Israel, his inheritance. And David shepherded him with integrity of heart, with skillful hands. He led them. As we read through Psalm 78, we recognize that this was a psalm that was essentially written to remind Israel why the judgment of God is something they're experiencing and why it also came upon them throughout history. 
I think it's important for us to read this because the song warns them to learn from those failures, those spiritual failures that their ancestors went through. And the encouragement there is to do everything that they can do to avoid the same path. What we see throughout Israel's history is doubt and unfaithfulness and rebellion. And that never ended well for them. And so this psalm is serving as a reminder to, to showcase that and say, look, whenever you have been doubting and unfaithful and in rebellion, there was consequences. We see God as a just God having to deal with this throughout Israel's history. And then also God's people today, I think, need to pay close attention to this psalm. Because in all honesty, there are a lot of churches and even organizations that don't place as much emphasis on God's presence and God's power because there's this sense of unbelief and even disobedience to his word. You know, I have the unique advantage of being able to worship in all different parts of the world in all different countries. And there definitely is much more of a sense of the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in other countries. And there's a couple reasons why I, I think that's the case um, versus the church in America. But what I will say is my, like my 15 year old daughter went with me for the first time a couple weeks ago when we went and one of the things that she recognized right away was, you know, mom, we, we read about this God in the Bible and we think, yeah, he can do he, these things, but does he? And I don't want to be a, the kind of Christian that, that questions that. Does God still show up in miraculous ways? Does, does God still show up in power? Can you still sense his presence? I want to be confident in that. And one of the things that we see very often in other countries is they regularly, like I'm talking about every single Sunday or every time they meet together, they rely on the manifest presence of the Holy Spirit for him to show up in the fullness of his presence and power. And that's when you see things like deliverance and healing. I mean, we saw, if you've been following along on the Facebook page, we saw uh, miraculous healing, a couple of them. We saw a, a demonic deliverance of, of a woman. We saw uh, gang members coming literally off the street, coming in and coming to faith in Christ. We saw God move in his presence and his power in a way that, you know, I've witnessed before, but for my young 15 year old daughter, it was the first time she had seen anything like that in person. And it changed her entire perspective on faith. And I think there are so many churches today that are missing out on the fullness of, of God's presence and his power, either because they don't believe, you know, they believe that maybe this stuff happened at one time, but they don't necessarily believe it's for today, or there's a disobedience to his word. And, you know, a lot of times what happens is there are a lot of churches that start preaching to entertain versus teaching f towards repentance or teaching to, um, help people understand their sin. And so, in a way, as we fail to recognize the biblical commands that we see throughout the pages of the scriptures, there is standards and examples that are should be the basis of truth, the foundation of truth, and for right behavior. Those things have gradually been diminished, and even the church has turned away from God and kind of gone their own way and done their own thing. And I think we see that evidenced by how many churches during COVID really fell apart. And if they weren't being held together by God's presence and God's power, there was really this this eye opening moment where we recognized, okay, are these just social clubs, or you know, what are we actually doing here? I have a lot more to get into, but I think we're going to take a quick break to hear a word from our sponsor, and then we'll pick up where we left off. Stay tuned. Let's see. If something costs less, but people are happier with it, that sounds like something to look into, and that's MediShare. Maybe you've heard switching to MediShare to pay for health care can save the typical family 500 bucks a month, and that's huge, but it's also true that people are way more satisfied after making the switch, too. The customer satisfaction rate... For MediShare is double that of the typical health insurance plan. Double. MediShare works. It's been around for more than a quarter century, and members have shared more than $3 billion of each other's bills. People love having telehealth and a huge nationwide PPO network. So, yeah, you can save a ton and like it better. Imagine being happy with how you're taking care of your health care. So if you're self-employed or part of the gig economy or you just want a plan you're happy with, you can call right now and get a price within two minutes. A very, very smart use of two minutes. Here's the number you need. 888-SHARE-19. That's 888-SHARE-19. 888-SHARE-19. The greatest red carpet you'll ever walk is through your front door. 
We're Dr. Josh and Christy Straub, marriage and leadership coaches and hosts of the Famous at Home podcast. With a realistic, grace-filled look at the struggles families face today, we cover topics designed to help you become a rock star under your roof, set healthy rhythms between work and home, and build a rock-solid marriage. To listen now, go to lifeaudio.com or search Famous at Home on your favorite podcast platform. So as we look through this psalm, we realize that it really has a pretty large historical span. It goes from the time of Moses all the way to the time of David, and it spans five centuries of Israel's history. So there's a lot to take into consideration as we're doing this historical reflection over the history of Israel. There's a couple things that I want to point out and draw your attention to. In verse 5, it says, He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our forefathers to teach their children. This is the idea of teaching their children. And as believers, we don't really have a choice whether or not we're going to teach our children. Um, And I guess not even just as believers, but just as humans or as parents in general. We don't have a choice of whether or not we're going to teach our children. It's a matter of what they're going to learn from us. And so there are other people who will look to us as an example. And the hope is that we ourselves will be looking to God's word as the guiding principle for our lives. And this essentially is a command that God has given to all of his people, you know, that we are to live a life that is worthy of the calling. And we can live up to that responsibility because God, whenever God requires something of us, he gives us the strength and the ability to be able to fulfill it and he empowers us to do it. Now, is it difficult? Absolutely. Are, do we mess up sometimes? Absolutely. But living according to God's righteous standard is really the goal for all of us. And we have to recognize that there are other people that are going to witness how we live our lives. Whether or not you're a parent doesn't really matter because there are other people within your circle of influence that are going to be paying attention to how you live your life. Let's jump down to verse 8. It says, They would not be like their forefathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation whose hearts were not loyal to God, whose spirits were not faithful to him. I think this is a verse that challenges God's people not to follow in the unfaithful footsteps of their spiritual ancestors. And while this is definitely a warning to Israel, this is, you know, real world applications for us. I mean, there are so many churches that have become self-serving country clubs that are not really recognizing true Christianity. They're not living out the biblical standard. And there are a lot of reasons for that. I mean, there are spiritual reasons. Sometimes it is a failure on the part of the leadership to recognize and even warn people when they're starting to fall off the rails. Um, And and I think that's hard because especially in a climate now where churches are struggling post-COVID, the attendance has not gone up to where it was pre-COVID. And so Um, in addition to that, there's things like tithe money that isn't coming in, or it's harder to run programs because they don't have enough volunteers or people to serve. I mean, there's a lot of different reasons for that, but, um, when the leadership is silent to people's sin or lifestyles of sin, you know, I get it that we're all, we all mess up and we all have this need for Jesus. I a hundred percent understand that, but when churches and church leadership do not, hold accountable the people in their church that starts us down this really dangerous path. And, you know, it can, not only is it unbiblical, it can ruin churches. I mean, this division that happens because of unchecked sin can really ruin a lot of churches. And then I also think there's an instance where there's a failure to take the actual true message and teaching of Jesus, the way we see it in the New Testament, and equate that to this source of guiding principles for our lives and even the direction of the church. I mean, if you think about even in terms of something as simple as outreach and missions, um, there, there are very few churches that place outreach and missions at the same priority as they would something like uh, women's ministry. And I'm not dogging women's ministry, obviously, you know, or, or insert favorite ministry here. But they seem to take outreach ministry, and I say this because I was an outreach pastor for a long time. They seem to take outreach ministry as an opportunity if they have enough money and if they have enough people and if there's a surplus. But, but we're not going to worry about that until we deal with our own people. 
And we have to recognize that the heart of the gospel was to reach those outside the four walls of the church. And there is an ignorance to that. And there's certainly a lack of outreach programming. And that's just one small area that I'm picking on. I mean, there's a lot of things that happen in the New Testament church that we are just not seeing. Even things like community, living together in community and fellowship, that's, that's rare to have true authentic community in a lot of churches today. And then there's also a failure to promote a commitment to the truth and the purity of the doctrine. And and by that, what I mean is there are a lot of moral issues that are rising up in our culture. And instead of teaching in churches, teaching people how to respond to that in a way that's loving but biblical, there is just an absence of teaching. And so people don't know what to do. Christians don't know how to respond. How do you how do you respond when we're in a, a cultural climate that is so depraved and yet almost everything you say can be twisted and turned around? We've not done a good job in our churches of equipping people to have those kinds of conversations. And then I also think there's another aspect of that where there is just tolerating sin. And not just with the leadership, but even members, you know, there, there was a season years ago that if people were living in sin, they would not be able to hold leadership positions with the church. Now, nowadays, that's not even the case. I mean, there are people that are openly living in lifestyles of sin that the churches are just turning a blind eye or, you know, and I'm not saying not to forgive them, but when we tolerate sin to such a way that it's not even called out or held accountable within the church, what how can we have an expectation that that's not going to affect our culture? I mean, um, even even things like uh, the way that the church is attacked on some of the different streaming platforms, the church is not vocal about those kinds of things. And so we have this environment where we are submersed heavily in this evil culture that is a downward spiral, and we're not learning from churches how to deal with that. I think this is the warning that we're seeing here in this Psalm 78, where it's talking about not to make the same mistakes that our forefathers did. And if we're not careful, if we're not paying attention, we're we're going to go down the exact same path. When it talks in verse 8 about how their hearts were not loyal and their spirits were not faithful, there's no generation of believers that will fully experience God's purpose and God's power if they don't prepare their hearts. And it comes from this place of pursuing a deeper relationship with God and to not only understand the truth of his word, but to really pursue what he says is right, to pursue that with excellence. And, you know, on one hand, you could have people who are really affectionate towards God and rooted in God that are avoiding some of the corrupt behaviors of the world. And you will have those individuals experiencing God's power and God's presence, but unfortunately they're in the minority. And my hope is that churches will start to recognize that there's this missing element and that missing element is the, is the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And through the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, he empowers us to live a life that is righteous. And I'm not saying that every church needs to be, you know, praying in tongues and all that. But what I am saying is, what is the evidence of the Holy Spirit <clears throat> versus maybe just like a country club that's getting together? And, and you know, I was talking to somebody last week about the, they were on the search for a, a church. And they said, how can I tell the difference between a good church and a bad church? And I said, well, first of all, you want to make sure that the gospel is preached. But the way, like if I were to move to a new town, the way I, I personally would start looking for a new church would be to go to their website or even go to a list, a local listing of food pantries. And when you see which churches host a food pantry, then I would go to those churches' um, websites and, and figure out what they're doing. And the reason why I say that is the outreach of a church is usually a good indicator of how seriously they take the gospel message. And of course, there's lots and lots of things. You want to make sure that they're preaching good, sound biblical doctrine and that they you know, are in a, a place that is you're comfortable with spiritually that, you know, they're not teaching stuff that is outside of the evangelical norm. But I, I always start with outreach ministries because to me that is such a good indicator of the health of a church. But again, we see a lot of churches today catering to the people that are coming 
instead of pursuing the Holy Spirit and allowing him to draw people in that are hungry for the Holy Spirit. I think there's a big difference. In verse 11, it says, They forgot what they had done, the wonders he had shown them. I think, plain and simple, Israel failed spiritually, at least in some ways, because they forgot the actions and the miracles that God did among their history and and the the patriarchs. And this serves or should serve as a lesson to us that we cannot forget the powerful works and miracles that God has done in and through the followers of Christ, not just in in the past, but even in the recent history. And it's sad. It's very sad because there are so many people that don't even know what God has done in recent history. And so that's part of the reason why we have to teach those things to our children. The issue with Israel is that over time, they really failed to follow the covenant and to faithfully follow God throughout their lives. And so I think the clue for that, and and we're going to go through and read this again. I think the clue for that when it comes to our relationship with God is that in order for us to maintain this relationship with God, we have to make a firm decision to remain loyal to him no matter what. And that decision means living out the promises of God, the commands of God, the standards of God, the principles of his word until eventually we're going to leave this world and we'll be with him forever. But between now and then, we have to be committed to righteousness. We have to be committed to, you know, repentance is not just saying, God, forgive me. Repentance is a change of behavior. And I, and I discussed that with one of my daughters even this, this week, because um, as many parents probably can recognize, sometimes they have a, my kids have a hard time getting up in the morning and getting out the door on time. And while there is some grace there, certainly I have grace for that. I was a kid once. Their school will have grace. At a certain point, if there's not a change in behavior, there's going to be consequence. And I think that is the part that so many of us miss is, is it's not just about grace and forgiveness. Yes, absolutely. We have a God of grace that forgives us, but he also longs for us to repent and to change our behavior. And that's, I think, the missing key for so many people, including people in our churches today. We know that God is merciful and he forgives and his patience and his mercy is clearly revealed. I mean, we see it in the psalm. We see it throughout the pages of the scriptures. But yet over and over, we see the people of Israel rebelling against God and God holding back his anger. Now, God is never going to abandon his children just because they don't follow him perfectly. That's not what I'm saying. But we must never take God's patience and forgiveness for granted by willfully disobeying and rebelling and refusing to to repent and to change. And so if we are continually grieving him by our sin, meaning we're continually offending him by sinning and just not giving any regard for his standard, there is eventually going to be a, a time where he judges us just like he judged Israel. Now, I know that that feels harsh. And, and perhaps, I mean, there are some people that say America is in a judgment season right now. I'm not saying we are or aren't. But what I do know is this pattern of behavior we have to be held accountable for or there is going to be a judgment. There is going to be a reconciling. There is going to be consequence for our behavior. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to reread starting at verse 1 and let some of those insights you know, kind of sit with you as we're thinking through the behavior of Israel and we're reflecting on that and allow that to help us understand where we need to go from here. Starting in verse one. Oh, my people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things from old, what we have heard and known, what our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our forefathers to teach their children. So the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. They would not be like their forefathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation whose hearts were not loyal to God, whose spirits were not faithful to him. The men of Ephraim, though armed with bows, turned back to the day of battle. They did not keep God's covenant and refused to live by his law. 
They forgot what he had done and the wonders he had shown them. He did miracles in the sight of their fathers, in the land of Egypt, in the region of Zoan. He divided the sea and led them through. He made the water stand firm like a wall. He guided them with a cloud by day and with light from the fire all night. He split the rocks in the desert and gave them water as abundant as the seas. He brought streams out of a rocky crag and made water flow down like rivers. But they continued to sin against him, rebelling in the desert against the Most High. They willfully put God to the test by demanding the food they craved. They spoke against God, saying, Can God spread a table in the desert? When he struck the rock, water gushed out and streams flowed abundantly. But can he also give us food? Can he supply meat for his people? When the Lord heard them, he was very angry. His fire broke out against Jacob, and his wrath rose against Israel, for they did not believe in God or trust in his deliverance. Yet he gave a command to the skies above and opened the doors of the heavens. He rained down manna for the people to eat. He gave them the grain of heaven. Men ate the bread of angels. He sent them all the food that they could eat. He let loose the east wind from the heavens and led forth the south wind by his power. He rained down meat on them like dust, flying birds like sand on the seashore. He made them come down inside their camp all around their tents they ate till they had more than enough for he had given them what they craved but before they turned from the food they craved even while it was still in their mouths god anger rose against them he put to death the sturdiest among them cutting down the young men of israel in spite of all this they kept on sinning in spite of his wonders they did not believe so he ended their days in futility and their years in terror Whenever God slew them, they would seek him. They eagerly turned to him again, and they remembered that God was their rock. The Most High God was their Redeemer. But then they would flatter him with their mouths, lying to them, lying to him with their tongues. Their hearts were not loyal to him. They were not faithful to his covenant. Yet he was merciful. He forgave their iniquities and did not destroy them. Time after time, he restrained his anger and did not stir up his full wrath. He remembered that they were but flesh, a passing breeze that does not return. How often they rebelled against him in the desert and grieved him in the wasteland. Again and again, they put God to the test. They vexed the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember his power the day he redeemed them from the oppressor, the day he displayed his miraculous signs in Egypt, his wonders in the region of Zoan. He turned their rivers to blood. They could not drink from their streams. He sent swarms of flies that devoured them and frogs that devastated them. He gave their crops to the grasshopper, their produce to the locusts. He destroyed their vines with hail and their sycamore figs with sleet. He gave over their cattle to the hail, their livestock to the bolts of lightning. He unleashed against them his hot anger, his wrath, indignation, and hostility, a band of destroying angels. He prepared a path for his anger. He did not spare them from death, but gave them over to the plague. He struck down all the firstborn of Egypt, the first fruits of manhood in the tents of Ham. But he brought his people out like a flock. He led them like sheep through the desert. He guided them safely so they were unafraid, but the sea engulfed their enemies. Thus he brought them to the border of his holy land, to the hill country his right hand had taken. He drove out nations before them and allotted their land to them as an inheritance. He settled the tribes of Israel in their homes. But they put God to the test and rebelled against the Most High. They did not keep his statutes. Like their fathers, they were disloyal and faithless, as unreliable as a faulty bow. They angered him with their high places. They aroused his jealousy with their idols. When God heard them, he was very angry. He rejected Israel completely. He abandoned the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent he had set up among them. He sent the ark of his might into captivity, his splendor into the hands of the enemy. He gave his people over to the sword. He was very angry with his inheritance. Fire consumed young men. <clears throat> their young men and their maidens had no wedding songs. Their priests were put to the sword and their widows could not weep. Then the Lord awoke as from sleep, as a man wakes from the stupor of wine. He beat back his enemies. He put them to everlasting shame. And then he rejected the tents of Joseph. He did not choose the tribe of Ephraim, but he chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loved. He built his sanctuary like the heights, like the earth that he had established forever. He chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheep pens. From tending the sheep, he brought him to be the shepherd of his people, Jacob, of Israel, his inheritance. And David shepherded them with the integrity of heart, with skillful hands, he led them. God, help us to recognize your hand in this in this psalm, in this story, as we reflect upon um, your faithfulness throughout Israel's history, despite the rebellion, and how even though you had to deal with their sin, you always had a measure of grace and rescue to bring them out of that 
pattern behavior and yet over and over we see the rebellion and the way that you continue to pursue them and care for them and and love them like a shepherd cares for his sheep god help us to to pay attention Help us as today's believers to pay attention to what's going on in the pages of the scripture and to the history of our, our spiritual ancestors, Lord God. Help us not to be walking in rebellion, but to have repentant hearts that, that focus and recognize your hand in our lives and that we would see the, the, the call to righteous living as not a restriction, but as a protection because you are good and you do good. And as a good father, you want the best for us. So Lord, I pray that um, in the moments where we are faced with decisions, we recognize and we remember the way that you work throughout the lives of the Israelites and how you continue to work through our lives. God, we thank you and praise you in all things. In Jesus name. Amen. Hey friend, do you feel like you need a little one-on-one? My goal for the She Hears ministry, the Hearing Jesus podcast, all the resources that we have is to really help you learn how to hear God's voice so that you can be confident in your relationship with him. And if you're struggling to learn how to identify or even overcome the barriers that you have in your life to growth, I want to be able to walk through that with you. Did you know that I'm a Christian life coach? Maybe you're struggling with something and you need some objective biblical insight or opinions, or maybe you need to work through something that feels just a little bit too heavy to do on your own. I would love to walk through that with you and land on some practical ways to achieve that goal. And so I have some limited coaching opportunities. If you go to shehears.org, there's a section where you can schedule some one-on-one time with me. I have Mondays and Fridays open right now going into the new year. So I pray that if that is something that you need, that you've been praying about, that it would be an opportunity for you to take advantage of some one-on-one time with me. And again, my heart is really to help you lean into whatever it is that God is calling you to do. I pray that that's a blessing for you. I want to take just a second to thank the team at Life Audio for their partnership with us on the podcast. If you go to lifeaudio.com, you'll find dozens of other faith-centered podcasts in their network. They've got shows about prayer, Bible study, parenting, and more. Hey friends, if this podcast helped encourage, empower, or equip you for God's call in your life, I would love it if you would head over to Apple Podcasts and leave me a review. That's the number one way you can support my show. You can also join our free Facebook community or Instagram page where I share inspirational tips, resources, and prayer throughout the week. Hey, I want you to know I'm praying for you this week. Know that you are loved, you are cherished, and you are His. Let's see, if something costs less, but people are happier with it, that sounds like something to look into, and that's MediShare. Maybe you've heard switching to MediShare to pay for health care can save the typical family 500 bucks a month, and that's huge. But it's also true that people are way more satisfied after making the switch, too. The customer satisfaction rate for MediShare is double that of the typical health insurance plan, double MediShare works. It's been around for more than a quarter century, and members have shared more than $3 billion of each other's bills. People love having telehealth and a huge nationwide PPO network. So, yeah, you can save a ton and like it better. Imagine being happy with how you're taking care of your health care. So if you're self-employed or part of the gig economy or you just want a plan you're happy with, you can call right now and get a price within two minutes. A very, very smart use of two minutes. Here's the number you need. 888-SHARE-19. That's 888-SHARE-19. 888-SHARE-19.